think, I think I could do this without that. Everyone well this morning? Well, praise God. This is um, part two of a sermon I began last week. Last week we began uh, looking at the rebuilding of the temple of God in Jerusalem under the leadership of Zerubbabel and uh, the governor and Joshua the high priest under the spiritual guidance of Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah and then Nehemiah. The Jews had been in exile because of their rebellion against God and now they repented. We talked about that last week. They repented of their sin and, um, and the Lord was restoring them to their former position. He was restoring them back to fellowship, restoring them back to the land of promise and um, restoring the house of God to its former glory. This is what we would call in, in the church, we would call this revival. God was bringing about a revival in Jerusalem, a revival in Israel for the people of God. And he speaks through the prophets Zechariah and Haggai and Ezra of what would soon take place in Jerusalem. But their prophetic, this, uh, their prophetic message would have a, suck, a secondary and ultimate fulfillment. You know, we, uh, you're familiar with the law of double reference. I've, I've taught this and you've heard this before, perhaps in other places. The law of double reference, where God would speak through a prophet, and the prophet would be speaking to those people at that time, in that position, about something current or something um, immediately to come. But there is a secondary or an ultimate fulfillment of that prom uh, prophecy for some time in the future. You, you with me? This is one of those occasions where God is speaking through the prophets, Zechariah, Haggai, Ezra. He's speaking to those prophets, to Israel, for their time. Saying that God is restoring them, He's going to restore them to Jerusalem, He's going to restore the temple, He's going to restore their worship, He's going to restore their spiritual lives. But we see it as a, as a prophecy of a future kingdom. This is, this is a restoration that will come in the last days. It will be fulfilled where God will restore once again. And uh, he's speaking about the glorious kingdom of Christ and the eternal kingdom of God in, in time to come. And the Lord says through Haggai to his people, to his people then and to his people now, I will be with you. I said what a wonderful promise that is that God has said to us that he will be with us. Isn't that a glorious uh, fact? Isn't that encouraging to know that as he moves, no matter what happens, God has said that he will be with us. He's with us, friends. And uh, God the Almighty, the Creator, of everything will be with us and he will restore his glory to his church and he says to Zechariah that it's not this is not going to be through might it's not going to be through military power it's not going to be through power it's not going to be through the works of man's ingenuity it's not going to be through any of our talents or any of our gifts but God is going to bring about a restoration of his glory to the church by the Spirit of God he said not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And God gives Zechariah a vision. He sees a lampstand, a, 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 um, a, uh, a candlestick, if you will, a candelabra, if you will. And in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, uh, and, and, uh, and I said, uh, and said unto me, um, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it, and one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. 
So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Zechariah 4, 1 through 4. Okay, so, so Zechariah sees his vision. He sees a lampstand. He sees a, a bowl. He sees trees. He, he sees these things. And, and, um, and uh, what he sees are seven lamps, or a candelabra with seven lamps on it. And these lamps represent God's people giving light to the world. It represents uh, the light of God shining out of his people, the seven lampstands. And Revelation in chapter 1, John the Revelator sees these seven lampstands in his vision. Are you with me? He sees the seven lampstands in his vision. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. John, the revelator, has the same problem that Zechariah has when he sees the, this lampstand. He doesn't know what it is. It's a mystery to him as well. It was a mystery to Zechariah, and it's a mystery to John, the revelator. And so Jesus clarifies. Jesus reveals to John what these represented. And, and he tells them that, uh, that they represented the seven churches of Asia that we read in, uh, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Now we know that in studying the seven churches of Asia, they, are, they were real uh, uh, churches existing at that time. But theologically, they represent the church of Jesus Christ throughout the ages. We see in each of those churches things that apply to the Christian church from, from the time of Christ right on through to our current days. So when we're looking at these seven churches of Asia, we're looking at ourselves. Are you with me? We're looking at the church of Jesus Christ. This represents the church of all ages. And John tells, or, or John sees in, in, in his right hand, the seven stars in his right hand. And, 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 God, and the Lord says that these are the angels or the messengers of the churches. Now I have long held the position, as many Bible scholars do, that these angels or these messengers of the church, uh, they, they, are, they are the messengers that, that God has appointed to those churches. He's talking about the pastors. But these are the messengers of the church. And here's the picture. That Jesus is holding the, the pastors in his hand. He's holding the messengers in his hand as he walks among the churches. You getting the picture? Now, this has always been an encouragement to me as a pastor, knowing that no matter what happens, Christ holds me in the palm of his hand as, as, as a messenger of the church, as the angel of the church. You say, well, pastor, you're no angel. I, I get that. But the Bible calls me an angel. It calls me a messenger. And, and the Lord holds us in the palm of his hand as he walks in the midst of his people. So, what does Zechariah see? Here's what Je Zechariah sees, it, you know, to the best uh, of our artistic ability. He sees, he sees the, the seven lampstands. He sees the bowl, which is a reservoir uh, for the oil. He sees the two olive trees on either side. Uh, and, um, and he asks, he, he asks the angel, What are these, my Lord? What, what are these? And, um, and there's, there's no answer given immediately. There's no answer. And the answer is delayed. And so the angel asks him, um, man of God, Zechariah, don't you know? Don't you know what this is? And, and Zechariah says, um, no, I, I, I don't know what this is. And, uh, and so Zechariah asks again, what are these two olive trees? And again, uh, what, what be these two olive branches? And the angel asks him again, don't you know? 
And again, Zechariah uh, answers, No, my Lord, I don't know. You, you, you getting it? No, I have no idea what this is. I don't know what it means. Zechariah had no clue what was, what was going on. He, he had no clue what was happening. Now, how often is this the case? Uh, we, we see and we understand but only in human terms. We, we understand with human reasoning. We wake up in the morning, we read the headlines, we turn on the news, we go out on the street, we go to work, we drive around, and, 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 we, and all we see is what we can understand only with our human reasoning and our human understanding. And frankly, uh, many times we have no clue what's really going on. Are you with me? Are you with me? <laughs> Often we really have no clue of what's really going on because we're processing it all with our human understanding. Hey friends, it, it, listen, in and of myself I have no idea who I am, I have no idea why I'm here, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do, I, I, sometimes I, I, I have no clue, but I'm in good company. <laughs> I'm in good company with Zechariah the prophet and with you all, to be frank. <laughs> Because we don't, oftentimes we don't understand. We, in our humanity, we, we only understand in our human reasoning. See, Zechariah had to be awakened. He had to be uh, awakened. This, this is the man of God. This is the prophet of God. But he has no idea what's going on. But friends, there's no shame in that. There's no shame in, in not understanding all that's happening in the world, all that's happening in our lives. There, there's no shame in not fully grasping all this because Zechariah, the man of God, needed to be awakened. Are you with me? He needed to be awakened. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Now stay with me. I know it's a little warm in here. Don't fall asleep on me. Listen. And he waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. That's a strange way to say he woke me up. If that's all that was intended. If all he was intended, if all that was intended here is that the angel came home and found Zechariah sleeping and woke him up, then that would be a very strange way of saying, you know, the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is awakened out of his sleep. That's a strange way of saying, saying he woke me up. But listen, I, I, I believe, listen, he, he's not saying I was a man asleep. You with me? He's not saying, I was a man of sleep and, and the angel woke me up. No, listen, I believe he's saying, not that I was asleep, but I needed to be awakened in the same way that a person who is asleep is not aware of what is going on around them until they are awoken. You with me? He's making a comparison. He's, he, he's drawing a picture. He's saying, I, I, I was as if a person sleeping, I needed to be awakened. He's talking about a spiritual awakening. A, a, a awakening uh, in, in, the, in his spirit. I believe that this is what he's talking about. An enlightening, enlightenment, if you will. And friends, this is what we need. This is what we need today. We need a spiritual awakening. So that as we look out at this crazy world, as we look out at this, at this masquerade going on in, in the world, we need to have a spiritual eye to understand what is this, what meaneth this, what does this mean, what is God doing? And what does he want me to do? What does he want us to do? How are we to see all this? We need a spiritual awakening in the body of Christ this morning. Amen. Listen. Uh, a revival of our spiritual senses. The ability to comprehend spiritually what is truly happening in the world and what God would have us to do about it. The first thing to know is that we don't know anything. <laughs> a good place to start. It's like, 
you know, in all of our wisdom, in all of our understanding. I think of Job just now, where Job is, you know, for, for the whole book of Job, he's, he's trying to figure it all out. He's reasoning all these things, and it still doesn't make any sense to him. And he comes to a conclusion, and finally, uh, God says, no, no, Job, that ain't it at all. And Job finally puts his hand over his mouth and says, what in the world was I saying? I, I, I don't know anything. <laughs> and that's a good place to start, friends, to, to realize that we, we think we know a lot of things, but we really don't. We really don't know anything. And, um, and, and it, uh, if somebody would only write another book, or if somebody would only have another leadership seminar, we might, we might figure it all out, right? No. No. Listen, what does he see? He sees, he sees this candle, candelabra. He sees the seven lamps. He, 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 sees, um, he sees the trees. He sees all this. And uh, finally, the angel answers. Now there's much debate amongst commentators as to really what this all means. But I, I, think, it, I think we could arrive at some conclusions here. Um, he, he, the angel finally says to him that the two olive branches, these two olive branches, he, he refers to them in the, in the Bible as the two anointed ones. Are you still with me? The two anointed ones. In Hebrew, literally, the two sons of oil. These two branches are the two sons of oil, the two anointed ones. Um, and uh, I believe in the immediate context, this, this represents Zerubbabel, the, the governor. Zerubbabel, the governor, the authority of the kingdom of, of God. And Joshua, the high priest, which is the spiritual aspect of of the kingdom of Christ. And so we, we see the two anointed ones, the two sons of oil, being the, uh, representing the authority of God's kingdom and the spiritual aspect of God's kingdom. These, these two men who are responsible for the rebuilding of the temple and reinstating the worship of God. You still with me? Representing the authority and the ministry of God. The bowl in the middle here, the bowl is the reservoir of oil. It's the supply. This bowl is supplying the seven candlesticks, the seven lamps, so that they will never burn out. The, and, and, uh, uh, so the bowl is, a, is the reservoir feeding the lamps. Without getting too graphic into all of this, the trees that are feeding the, uh, the lampstands are, these are olive trees. This, this friends, is the ultimate uh, resource. It is the, it is the continual, endless supply. You see, you, we're not just talking about a reservoir. We're talking about two trees that are constantly growing olives to produce the olive oil that will fill the, the, uh, the uh, reservoir that will keep the lamps burning for all time. Get the picture? We know in Scripture that olive oil is very often used as a type of the Holy Spirit. So this is a picture, friends, of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, an endless supply of the Holy Spirit filling our reservoirs so that our lamps will remain burning. The church will have light endlessly, uh, constantly. The lamps remain burning because of the supply of oil. A constant supply from the reservoir. The reservoir has a perpetual supply coming from the very source, the trees. You still with me? Okay. The branches right here. The, 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 the two branches, the, the two sons of oil, the two anointed ones. Uh, uh, friends, I believe that these branches are God's allowance of the human involvement in His eternal plans. I'm going to make this make sense in, in, in a moment. The, this, this, these branches, the Zerubbabel, Joshua, is, is God allowing human involvement with His eternal plan. 
He, he could have just supplied right from the tree to the, to, the, uh, to the reservoir, but he chooses to use these two individuals, these two humans, Joshua and Zerubbabel. And listen, friends, uh, and I'll get to that in a, more in a moment, but there, there is no light. We get from this picture, there is no light apart from the Holy Spirit. You get that? There's, without, without the Holy Spirit, there is no light. There's a constant supply of spiritual anointing, but there is no light without Him. Um, I know, it's, it's warm in here. I have a, a friend who is... I have a friend. <laughs> you find that surprising? I have a friend, he's an MD. He called me the other day. He's not a believer. Working on him, working on him. But uh, he, he, uh, he called me the other day and he, and he said, uh, he said, Rev, he said, um, are you seeing an increase in anxiety among your people? He said, because I am. He's a doctor. He's a medical doctor. And he's asking me, he's saying, I've seen an uptick, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, over the past year or so. Um, uh, I'm treating more and more people for anxiety. And he's asking me as a, as a pastor, are you seeing the same thing amongst your people? Is, uh, is, there, is there an uptick in anxiety? And I said, no, doc. No. I said, uh, yeah, we all get anxious from time to time, but, but as far as, as anxiety, clinical anxiety, that kind of fear that you're asking me about, no. I said, because we understand uh, to some degree that God is doing something. We understand because we have the Bible. And from reading the Bible, we know that these things are going to happen in the last days. This is, this is biblical prophecy unfolding before us. So we don't understand everything. I, we don't know what all is happening, but we know that God is in control. And so because we know that, we are not taken by anxiety. No, I, I, we, we don't have a, a problem with anxiety in the church because we know what God's Word says. Listen, without the Holy Spirit, this is what I, what I, what I was reminded of. Without the Holy Spirit, this is a very dark place. This world can be a very dark place. Without the Spirit, without the, uh, the strength He gives, without the guidance He gives, without the help He gives, uh, as we see anxiety increasing in the world. And so it, uh, it can be a very dark place without the Holy Spirit. But the constant light of the Holy Spirit flowing through His ministers and through His church, uh, we, we have the light. Amen? All right, I said um, human involvement. Uh, regarding human involvement, God used Zerubbabel and Joshua. You know, isn't it amazing? God, I said this, I think I said last week, maybe two weeks ago, or three, whatever. God doesn't need us. You understand that, right? God doesn't need us. God doesn't need us anything. He doesn't need anyone. He doesn't need anything. He is self-sufficient. He has been forever and he will be forever. He doesn't need us. But he chooses to use us. In his plan of salvation, he involved human, humankind. In, in, in all of his plan, in the plan of the church and in the light of the church, he has, he has chosen to use humans, to humanity, and, and, and he's involved us in his plan. In Zechariah chapter uh, 4 verses 7 through 9 he says, Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. Zerubbabel laid the foundation of the temple. God used him to lay the foundation of the temple. Ezra tells us that the foundation was laid. Are you with me? The foundation is laid. The Apostle Paul tells us, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So, 
Jesus Christ is the foundation of his church. This is prophetic. This is Christ, the, the foundation of his church. In fact, he is the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is the first stone laid, and then the rest of the foundation is built off of that, and then the rest of the building is built upon that. Jesus is that foundation that, that Zechariah saw. It's the foundation that God was speaking about. That, that, um, and, and Zechariah, uh, as Zerubbabel, is building upon this. Here's the picture. He lays the, the, the foundation. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He is the alpha, the beginning, the first, the author or originator of our faith. He is the founder of our faith. He's the cornerstone. He, and then Zerubbabel also laid the headstone or capstone. The capstone is the crowning or completion of the work. And so Jesus is the omega the end, the last, the finisher or completer of our faith. Here, friends, is a picture that, that everything, everything uh, begins and ends with Jesus. He's the cornerstone and he's the capstone. He's the beginning and he's the end. He's the alpha, he's the omega. He's the first, he's the last. He is everything. And from, from the cornerstone to the capstone, Jesus is. And Jesus said that for without me you can do nothing. We can do nothing without him. But he's chosen to use us. He's chosen to use you. Look at the people that God has chosen to use. Am I making any sense to you this morning? Look at the people that God has chosen to use down through the, through the ages. Um, you know, there's... Um, uh, for the most part, there's not many nuclear physicists and, and uh, not many rocket scientists that God has chosen that he is involved in his kingdom plan. I mean, look what he said to Paul when he wrote uh, to, to the Christian church. Paul says, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Look at this is what Jesus says. This is what God has chosen to do his eternal plan. He's chosen to use us. Look at He took nothing and made everything. The universe he made from nothing. All, all creation he made from nothing. So we, we therefore qualify. Listen, I'll speak for myself because I, I don't want to offend anyone. But according to what Paul says, listen, um, the foolish things, <laughs> I qualify. The weak things, that are me. Right? right? The base things, that, that's, that's my life. I, I, I can't speak for you, but he's chosen the foolish and the weak and the base things to confound everybody else he, he's, he, so that he will receive all the glory. Listen, if we were fully equipped for all the things that God has chosen for us to do, then we can say, look, I did it. But no, we're not. We, we, in our own abilities, we have absolutely nothing so that the glory goes to Christ. It goes to God alone. Amen. And he's chosen to involve you and me, foolish and weak and broken to perform his eternal deeds and, and to fulfill his eternal plan. As the Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Hey, wait a minute. Don't stop there. According to the power that worketh in us. Listen, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can possibly ask of him and far above anything that you can comprehend. But listen, how he does it? Through the power that's working in you. That's the Holy Spirit. 
That's a human involvement. God can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think by the Spirit that's working in you. I don't know. I'm pretty excited about that. The power of the Holy Spirit. Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. And listen, and when, and when we stand before Christ on that day, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we give an account for our lives, I'm talking to you, child of God. When we've been... Listen... <laughs> We were, we were sinners. We were vile. Don't say you weren't. Because that's what the Bible says, that we were, we were sinners. We were enemies of God. Enemies. And, and God, He came. And He drew us unto Himself. He called us unto Himself. And, and He gave us the ability, the faith, and the grace to receive this wonderful gift. And then, then He washed us. He cleansed us. He washed away our sin. He justified us. He sanctified us. He adopted us as children. He made us sons and daughters of His own. He calls us His own children. He gave us His Holy Spirit, empowering us for the work that He has called us to do. He's enabling us to do what He has called us to do. And then when we stand before Him on that day of judgment, He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. And we get rewarded for all that He has done in us. Who doesn't want that? I don't understand how somebody could say, I don't want any of that. Listen, we are, we are, He chooses to use us to fulfill His, His kingdom plan. Ah, glory to God. But in this revelation to Haggai and Zechariah and Ezra and Nehemiah, as, he, as he's speaking, as the Lord is speaking through Haggai the prophet, he says that, listen, everything has to do with the glory of God. You're right? Everything. Creation. God didn't create you for you to enjoy your life and to just run around. and No, He created you for His glory. The world exists for His glory. The stars in the heavens all exist for His, for his glory. Look, we don't need to find if there's life anywhere else out there. If it is, it's for God's glory. It's not for us. It all exists for His glory. Everything exists for His glory. And he says that, that there will be a shaking of the nations. Listen to what he said to Haggai. He said, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Listen, God is saying that, that, that there is a time coming when all the nations, God will shake the nations. Listen, I don't know where you live, but where I live, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. We've seen things in this past year, or past couple of years, that um, I'm at a loss of words to describe. Can't even put it into words. The world is being shaken. And friends, hear me. We are about to see craziness at a level we cannot anticipate or comprehend. I've said at times past, fasten your seatbelts. You think it's been crazy now? We are about to see craziness at a level that would that is that will would boggle your mind. You you would you would stand there and say, I, what in the world is happening? We're we're going to see craziness at that level that you can't even comprehend. Mark my words. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. God speaking to the writer of Hebrews, he said, whose voice speaking, he's talking about when, when Moses went up to Sinai and received the Ten Commandments and, and God shook the mountain. He says, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. 
And this world yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. God is saying that there is coming a shaking of the nations, a shaking of the heavens and the earth, and everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Now the real shaking will take place during and after the tribulation. Matthew chapter 24 verses 29 and 30. There's a time coming when God will shake the nations and shake the heavens uh, and um, in, in judgment against Israel and in judgment against the world and unbelievers. Um, and, and that's coming. But, but it has begun now. The shaking has begun now. Listen, all the works of man are about to be tried. And all the works of the church are about to be tested. And what is of God cannot fail. What is of God cannot be shaken. Everything else can be and will be shaken. Anything not built on the solid rock, on, on the foundation of Jesus Christ, will fall. It will fail. It's like Paul talked about everything that is done um, for ourselves, for this world, is wood, hay, and stubble. It will all burn up in the fire of God's glory in His, in His judgment. Everything that is, is not of God will burn or be shaken or destroyed. And only that which is done for His kingdom, only that which is of God's kingdom will endure the shaking that's coming. Listen, the only thing that will survive is the kingdom of God and those who belong to it. What are you holding on to? What is it that you call your foundation? What is it that you've built your life on? What is it that you've built your hopes on? What is your foundation? I hope it's not your career. I hope it's not your savings account. Or your retirement, God help you if it is, that's all I can tell you. It's not, what, what is it that we, what is it that you have established? What is it that you call your foundation? What are you holding on to? Klaus Schwab in the World Economic Forum, the author of The Great Reset, if you haven't looked into it, you, you better, you better, <laughs> you should have already, but you better now. Listen. Klaus Schwab, the, 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 the World Economic Forum says that, you know, by the year 2030, you will own nothing and be happy. And that's the intention, that's the plan. The, 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 the globalists have a plan for the new world order. You've heard that before. The new world order, by 2030, their plan is that you will own nothing. There will be no private ownership. The government will ho own everything, but you'll be happy. Well, I, I, I won't get into too much there, but listen, I have news for Herr, Herr Schwab. <laughs> we get it all. Wer bekommen alles, Herr Schwab? <laughs> Wer bekommen alles? <laughs> es ist alles unser, Herr Schwab. It's all ours. We get it all. The church gets it all. The Bible says that the wealth of the, wor of the, of the world, the heathen, is being stored up for, for God's people. Listen, it's all ours. We are, we are heirs with Jesus. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It's, it's all ours. No matter what their plan is, no matter what the idea is, it's, it's all ours. Listen, I'm, I'll close with this. Uh, God has a plan. And He's working out all the details to that plan. He always has been. He always has been. And it doesn't look like anything that we possibly could have imagined. What, what, what is happening, what's going to happen, it's like nothing you have ever imagined. And He has called you, or is calling you, to be part of His eternal plan. Listen friends, um, what, when, when God restores and when He fills His house with His glory, and he restores and, 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 and lights the church and, and all the light that comes out of the church and all the glory of God's house. All of these things, it's not going to be accomplished through human ingenuity. It's not going to be accomplished through AI or Elon Musk or Bill Gates or Klaus Schwab or George Soros or Donald Trump. Listen, it, it's not 
this is not a political thing, it is a biblical thing. What God is doing, and he is about to do, has nothing... Now, he, 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 he may use politics, and he may use business and economies and all of that, but it, but it, is, a, it is a biblical thing that God is doing. It is not by might or power, but by his Spirit. And it won't be accomplished through the Assemblies of God or the Southern Baptist Convention or the Catholic Church. It will not be accomplished through might or power, but by the Spirit of the living God. And so I ask you in closing, are you trusting in the Sovereign Lord? Are you trusting in Him? Because He'll see us through whatever is coming. Whatever craziness is coming, whatever the world has concocted, whatever wiles of the devil, whatever the prince of the powers of the air have in store, whatever happens to our economy, whatever happens to our nation, whatever happens to the church, whatever happens, the Lord is in the midst of his church. Amen. And he is the source of our light and he is the source of our power and he will continue to be an ever lasting, endless source. So he'll see us through whatever is coming, whether here or there. Amen. Here, there, or in the air, God is with his people, and he's going to see us through. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. It is not by might. It is not by power. But it is by the Sovereign Lord. It is by the Spirit of the Living God. So Lord, I ask you today to speak to every heart through this. Uh, Lord, you have called us, uh, as you did uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua, as you did Israel, to restore us, God, to, to bring the, the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to, to shine out of this church, to shine out of our lives. Lord, you have given us the, the reservoir of oil. We could be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with your anointing, with an endless supply that flows from heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you have involved us in your eternal work, that we are filled or can be filled with your Spirit to do what you have called us to do. Lord, I pray that when, when things are shaking and when we see the shaking, we won't be afraid. And we won't look and say, what in the world is going on? But we'll have that, that consciousness of your presence. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I will be with you. Thank you, Lord, for that promise. Help us, God, to build our lives upon you, upon the chief cornerstone, upon Jesus Christ. Lord, you are both the cornerstone and the capstone. You're the beginning and the end. You're the first. You're the last. You're everything in between. Help us, Lord, to build our lives upon you. God, and use us for your glory. Flow through us, Lord. Let the light of your uh, gospel shine out of our lives, Father God, that you might receive all the glory and all the honor. Revive our church, Lord. I pray that the fire of your Holy Spirit would burn brightly in this church. Lord, that you'll bring back to us the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, that we will move uh, according to your Spirit. God, help us to be awakened, to know this revival of your Spirit, Lord. Awaken us, God, as, as uh, people that were asleep. Help us to be awakened, to see and understand, Lord, what you're doing. And we ask this, Lord God, that you might receive all the glory and the honor. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And would you stand with me? As we enter into the presence of the Lord this morning. Lord, our hearts are open to you. We want you to be glorified, Father God. We ask that you would have your way, Lord.
by your love amazing grace amazing love how you love us Lord God Lord we magnify your name this morning be exalted Lord God we are a moment you are forever Lord God before time, we are a vapor, you are eternal, love 
of everlasting reigning on high holy holy lord god almighty worthy is the lamb who was slain highest praise is honor and glory be on Sacrifice of praise to bring an offering, Lord God, that you might be glorified. 